Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on the Bystander Challenge. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Um, for those of you who don't know about this webinar series, or if this is your first time, want to say welcome to you and thank you for joining. My name is Ashley Virtue. I'm from the National Conflict Resolution Center, and we have decided to put on this series of webinars called Navigating the Uncharted. That's the name of the series. And it's really designed to help those of us who are in leadership roles and various roles in workplaces across the United States navigate some of the most challenging issues that we find we are tackling today in our workplaces. I think we all know and recognize that today's workplace looks different than it did 10 years ago or even five years ago. And we are constantly addressing new exciting opportunities as well as new challenges. And so this series exists to provide resources and tackle some of the topics that we're all dealing with, we're all thinking about in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm thrilled that you're with us today. I'm so excited today to be joined uh, by a wonderful uh, colleague of mine, someone that we have, uh, I've worked with over the years, Virginia Morrison. She joins us from Second Chance Beer Company. And Virginia, do you wanna introduce yourself really quickly? Sure, hello everyone out there. As uh, Ashley said, my name is Virginia Morrison. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Second Chance Beer Company. And I also serve on the National Brewers Association Board where I co-chair the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Wonderful. So you will hear more from Virginia uh, shortly and uh, more about why she is uh, here to talk with us a little bit about this idea of bystander intervention and upstander intervention when it comes to workplaces. So um, really, when we think about bystanders, this is something that I think is a is a fascinating concept for many of us. We have all been bystanders in the workplace. Every single one of us has had an experience where we have seen, heard, witnessed in some way behavior that we find somewhat inappropriate or maybe is a red flag. And we have asked ourselves the question, what do I do right now? How do I address this? And usually when we're asking ourselves this question, it's a, it's a moment of panic because we're feeling like we maybe want to do something, we don't know exactly what to do, and we, we certainly feel like we need to or we should, but we're just not sure what the right thing to do is. And we at the National Conflict Resolution Center recognized this years ago, especially as the hashtag MeToo movement picked up steam, that there were so many individuals out there who wanted to take action, who really felt that call, but didn't know how to do it effectively. And so we developed the Bystander Challenge as a workshop to help navigate that issue. And you know, we really talk about it in the context of any level of employee. There are different responsibilities that those of us who are in leadership and management have, but for any level of employee, this can be a really concerning topic. And the reason why, I think part of the reason why, is that bystanders really find themselves in a gray area. And on the screen, you can see there's kind of a continuum of behavior that we look at in the workplace. And on the one end, there's harassment, you know, outright harassment or discrimination. And I would argue that as horrific as it is to see or witness harassment or discrimination, it's sometimes easier to deal with because there are policies in place. We know who we're supposed to go to. There's, there's, a, there's a protocol to follow. And so it's, it's horrific to see, but, you know, in terms of how do I deal with harassment, sometimes it can be a little easier because it's a little more cut and dry. But are bystanders always witnessing outright harassment or discrimination? Of course not, right? Bystanders find themselves in this middle ground where on the other end of the continuum, you can see the word microaggressions. And there are a lot of words for microaggressions. Some people love this term, some people hate it. But Essentially, what microaggressions are, are they are the everyday little things 
that add up over time that harm someone. And oftentimes they're said as a joke. Sometimes the person who does or says a microaggression doesn't even know they've done it. Um, but they're, they're these little slights that are about your identity, your value. And they, over time, really wear you down when you have them happen to you over and over and over again. And so this concept of microaggressions, when it really boils down to it, is about those little everyday things that you experience because of who you are and that on their own might not matter that much, but over time really add up to potentially a feeling of harassment or at least not feeling valued the way that you hope you would be. And so these are the things that bystanders witness all the time and don't know what to do because we ask ourselves these questions, you know, oh, is that really my business? Was that bad enough to say something? Is this where I should get involved? Is that my role, right? But we know that over time when bystanders don't act, these behaviors increase over time. And eventually we start to see on this continuum of behavior that we get more into that category of harassment. And that's where we see the huge problems really, really start. So our goal is to empower individuals, empower our employees, our teams to feel confident to speak up when they see the smaller things and not to do so in some sort of tattletale way where we can't joke, we can't have fun, we can't have camaraderie, but to do so in a way that is supportive, that embraces a culture of workplace respect and different dynamics. So <clears throat> We feel really excited about this idea because time and time and time again, we do these workshops, we talk to people about how to be effective upstanders, and they leave feeling like, oh, I see, when I do this the right way, I'm actually encouraging my team, I'm actually supporting my team, not bringing it down to you know some sort of place where we feel like we can't joke around or have fun. But I think it is important to acknowledge that as, as bystanders, there are a lot of reasons we don't act. And so what we find, what you have probably found maybe in, in your experience at some point in a workplace is that there's really three most typical responses from bystanders when they're not sure what to do. The first is to just avoid the situation altogether. Um, we've all done this. I hate to admit that I have done this, but I have in my life. I have avoided a situation because it was uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do. There was a power dynamic I wasn't sure of. Whatever the reason, this is the most typical. A bystander will just avoid the situation. The other is to accommodate the behavior. And we have to think about what that means, accommodate the behavior. So what that can mean is something like, oh, you know, that's just how Ashley is. You know, let's just let's, let Ashley be Ashley. She's a great earner or people love her, but we're going to accommodate. We're going to make an excuse for her, right? Accommodation can also be a lot more subtle. You can accidentally accommodate a bad behavior by even nervously laughing along with an inappropriate joke. You might be doing that because that's just your general response to what you heard and you don't really know what to do, but it looks like support of the behavior. So there's a few ways we find ourselves accommodating the behavior. And then the third behavior we see a lot from bystanders is they go on the attack. Now here, the bystander has done something, right? They're standing up, they're being courageous, they're saying something, but they're doing so in an attacking way, in a way that makes the person responsible for the behavior uncomfortable, on the defensive, maybe the target of that behavior feels embarrassed. And ultimately, what we know is that going on the attack in these scenarios doesn't help with the long-term behavior change. It may stop it in the moment, but it doesn't help with the long-term behavior change. So this is also not the best strategy to use. So it's important to recognize that these behaviors exist, that we will typically want to respond these ways. And that's because these are natural responses. These are our natural fight, flight, freeze responses in our brain to conflict when we see it. And so it's important that we recognize that these may be what we want to do, but we have to train our brains out of that. We have to train our brains of what we need to do instead so that we can stop behaviors before they escalate. 
And that is why I have my wonderful colleague Virginia here with us to give us a little bit of a case study of where we've seen this uh, happen before. Yeah, so this uh, lover, fellow lover of the F word and very brave woman, Brianne Allen, um, came into my life as well as many of us within craft beer in the spring of 2021, when she posed uh, a question on her Instagram account. Actually, she relayed a story of being discriminated and harassed against in her employment at a brewery. And then she asked a question, has anyone else experienced sexism in craft beer? And what she got is the reason she said it's brutal because she got thousands and thousands and thousands of mostly women, but also some men reaching out to her on Instagram with either anonymous or even named accounts of breweries that had allowed harassment, discrimination to happen, people who'd raped, sexually assaulted, just groped, really, really horrific behavior. And so within craft beer community, we had um, the occasion to have what I refer to as a reckoning. So at that time, I had uh, the position of being the San Diego Brewers Guild president, um, as well as being on my first year board of the Brewers Association board. So I uh, was interviewed time and time again about this on the local news. And at the national level, because my background is, is in employment law, um, I was looked to for advice on how do we combat this? What do we need to do as an industry? What do we need to do as a community in order to prevent these uh, you know, instances of harassment and discrimination happening in the future? So I fortunately, again, because of my background in employment law, knew of organizations like the National Conflict Resolution Center. Ashley, you can go ahead and advance that slide. And so these, like, if you can take time and kind of just glance at some of these. These are the really graphic and horrifying accounts um, from women within our industry across the world, not even just in the United States. So because I knew of the National Conflict Resolution and I had been connected with them, I had this idea that you know, what we needed to do as a community and as you know, an organization like the Brewers Association was to educate our you know, members, AKA the brewery owners and leaders within our industry, as well as the employees and even the consumers, the guests who are in our tasting rooms, the, how to recognize um, these, you know, whether it's a microaggression or an instance of harassment or discrimination, and then how to go from being an upstander or bystander to an upstander. So if you go ahead and advance, Ashley. And so one of the uh, things that I'm really passionate about that I think comes into play here is something called courageous conversations. So it's how do you speak up in the moment, in times where it's not always comfortable. And I think one of the best practices is to stay or be curious. And so some of you may have heard the adage of, you know, is it true, is it necessary, and is it kind? And if you can't say yes to all of those, then the you know, invitation might be that maybe it doesn't need to be said. So one of the things that I like to do if I'm in the unfortunate uh, circumstance, but the very real possibility of watching someone be insulted, if you will, is I have the you know, curious question. I say, why would you say that? Like in the moment, speak up or, huh, I, I guess I'm not really understanding what you mean and give the person an opportunity to explain themselves because it might be that they absolutely did not intend to offend or to you know, discriminate or harass someone or you know, microaggress them. Uh, but being in that state of giving them the opportunity to explain themselves can oftentimes diffuse the situation. And then you know, as, a, as a second practice, perhaps you follow up with that person and explain to them why maybe their, um, their communication or their comment was not um, the best that it could have been under those circumstances. Thank you so much, Virginia. And one of the things that I really love about this concept of, of staying curious is that we, we have to consider all of the people involved in the situation, right? So we're thinking about, you know, staying curious. We have to think of ourselves as, as a bystander. Am I staying curious about 
watching out for these things? Or am I kind of putting my head in the sand and saying, I'm just, if I don't hear it, I don't have to do anything. Um, and so, you know, am I staying curious from that perspective? Staying curious about how you approach the target, right? So if there was somebody who was harmed in some way, you know, what's their perspective and how do I, how do I approach them? We don't ever want to assume we know how a comment made someone else feel. And I pose an interesting rhetorical question to the group. You don't have to necessarily answer in chat, but one thing that comes up all the time in our workshops is, well, what if I was offended by it, but it didn't impact the target? You know, the person who this was said to doesn't care, they're friends, they're cordial, it didn't matter to them. So I act and it, it wasn't needed to be act on, acted on. And I always pose the question, okay, so what if that is the case? I would argue that action may still be needed because just because it wasn't necessarily a joke that maybe offended that person, does it mean that it didn't offend the other person in the room, other bystanders, or that it wouldn't at some point? And so, you know, we come up with all these reasons to not act, but the reality is that if we are actively pursuing healthy, safe, respectful work environments, we have to approach all of the conversations with um, this ability to pursue that regardless almost of if it you know, impacted the target or not. And then you know, to Virginia's point about staying curious with the person responsible, uh, you'll notice that's a word we're using a lot today. We don't say the harasser, we don't say you know, the, the bad guy in the workplace, um, the person responsible for the behavior. And that is because again, as I mentioned, a lot of the times when we're talking about microaggressions, so not that outright harassment and kind of horrific things that we've seen, um, that especially the craft brewing industry had to experience. But when we see those microaggressions, a lot of the times the person responsible wasn't even aware they did it or they've never been talked to about it before. And so approaching them with kind of a human centered approach, a curious approach, while also being very firm in, you know, your stance on behaviors that should change um, really goes a long way in terms of that being an effective conversation. Because we, we say this all the time at NCRC, I might have the most important message in the whole world to deliver, but if I can't say it in a way where it can be received on the other end by the other person, then I may as well have just wasted my breath, you know, if, if it can't be received on that end. And so our goal here is to approach and have these discussions in ways that, again, create long-term change. So that is such a great best practice and so appreciate you sharing that with us. Another best practice that uh, we want to leave you with and, and talk about today is um, this one of when. When do you act as a bystander? Because this is a huge question for people. So what we teach at NCRC is that there really are two intervention moments that are equally important. One is in the moment. So this is as a bystander, when you see or hear something going on, doing something right in that moment that's effective, that stops the behavior. Now, obviously today we are doing a 30 minute webinar on this topic. Um, our full bystander challenge workshop is up to three hours long. So we won't have time to get into all of the details of what those interventions are. But what we talk about is that in the moment, this could be a direct statement. This could be something where you really are empowered and able to make a direct statement in the moment that isn't again to shame or condemn anyone, but is clearly there to stop the behavior. However, there are situations where in the moment, this also could just be a distraction, right? Because your goal as the bystander is to make the behavior stop, to come to the aid of the, of the target. And given different power dynamics, whatever the setting you're in is, um, it may not be appropriate for you to make a direct statement in the moment. In fact, as we've done multiple workshops with the Craft Brewers Association and talked to many, many people in leadership there, 
one of the questions that's come up is, you know, hey, we work in the industry of alcohol. And so there are times where if people are, are drinking a lot, maybe a direct statement isn't going to work as effectively as you want it to. And so you might need to, you know, um, do a distraction methodology or something along those lines, again, to just change the behavior right then to make sure that it stops. That's your goal there. So um, now a lot of us are not in an industry where alcohol is a normal part of our workday, but, um, you know, it's just one example of how this applies across the board, whether you're working in a factory or a brewery or um, back of the house at a restaurant or you're working in a corporate office. These are these are all the same strategies need to apply. So intervening in the moment is is critical. And one thing that I just would encourage you here and that we dive into a little bit more in our trainings is I mentioned how we have to train our brains. And I want you to go back to thinking about the typical responses of avoiding, accommodating, and attacking. If you don't think ahead of time about how you're going to respond in the moment, you will fall back on one of those three things, avoiding, accommodating, or attacking. Because again, they are our natural response to uncomfortable situations. And so don't wait until you're in that situation as a bystander to figure out what you're going to do. Think about it ahead of time. Think about it now. Think about it later. I know this might sound silly, but I honestly believe in this just practicing the words out loud to yourself in the car. Um, but doing that is part of training yourself so that when that moment comes, you really do feel empowered that, that you can say something. And um, we could spend probably you know hours on what exactly to say, but the key when you are trying to speak up, and especially if you're trying to maybe make a direct statement, is that make it authentic to you. You may be able to say a very genuine statement, like something I would say that's authentic to me is, you know, Virginia, I usually love your jokes, but that one didn't land for me. Um, I would say that. And anyone who knows me wouldn't be surprised to hear me say that. But for some of you, that doesn't sound at all like you. And so wanting to make it um, genuine and authentic to who you are is important. The other thing I would say is that um, focus on the behavior not the person. So in that example I just gave, uh, where I said, you know, Virginia, that joke didn't really land for me. I'm focused on the joke. I didn't say, Virginia, you crossed a line with that one, right? Because now all of a sudden she's the bad guy if I'm saying that. So I try to focus on the behavior, not the person. So there's just a couple of tips for in the moment, because Honestly, let's be honest, that is the scariest time for all of us. That's the, that's the moment we all think about when we worry about being bystanders, um, is what would I do right then? However, as important as in the moment is the follow-up. Now, why? Let's say you've just said a brilliant thing, you stop the behavior in the moment, everyone in the room understands that you do not stand for that kind of, of language or behavior. Um, why do you need to follow up? Well, the reason is that, again, we're looking for long-term behavior change here. So no matter how great that moment was that went, the follow-up, particularly with the person responsible, is critical. Now, again, in our longer workshop, we kind of talk about options here. Is this a conversation that you're having one-on-one -on -one with them? Hopefully, maybe that's the best case scenario. Depending on your relationship though, or again, maybe a power dynamic, maybe that's not possible. So there could be an option of delegating it to someone else who perhaps has a different relationship with them or is in even human resources. But the follow-up is critical, making sure that someone, and hopefully ideally in most situations, you, um, can have a conversation, a healthy, supportive, encouraging conversation with the person responsible to circle back around to that behavior and make sure that they understand that one, why, why did you say something? Why was it a flag for you? Why does this matter even, right? And two, reinforce that you're paying attention. Reinforce that, you know, you are supporting a workplace where everyone feels safe, respected, and heard. And that includes the person responsible, right? So going back to that principle of staying curious that's where coming into this conversation with some humility, some open-ended questions, 
being ready for them to maybe be defensive, but to be ready to have that conversation with them and, and really hold true to your values, why a respectful workplace is important to you. These are all things that help progress that conversation. Now, will it be easy and go perfectly? No, of course it won't. I mean, some might, but there will be difficult people. And so you have to go in ready for that. But I assure you of this, and I know this from our over a decade of working really, really intensely in this specific area of bystander intervention, it does have an impact, a positive impact. And even if you leave the conversation feeling like, you know, did they get it or did that work? It tends to strengthen your relationship with that person over time, maybe not that day, but over time, it really does. And two, it strengthens the team. It sends a message that we're paying attention to these issues and this is our culture. Now, if you are on the webinar today and you are a workplace leader, this obviously has a whole other level for you, right? Because not only are you trying to empower your team to be effective upstanders, but you are leading by example. And so you have the extra pressure of really making sure that when you are a bystander to action on your team or around you, even with your peers, you are stepping up. It's opening day, stepping up to the plate. I'm going to use a baseball reference um, that you are stepping up to address those issues because people are looking to you to see what type of tone there will be in the workplace. And if you are not someone who's able to have these conversations, to make brief neutral statements in the moment that send, you know, a clear message about respect and to do follow up conversations, then they are others will feel un unlikely to be able to do that as well. So I encourage you leadership, no matter what level of leadership you are and whether that is formal or even informal leadership in your workplace. Do know that there's this extra responsibility, but also extra opportunity for you to be a true leader in this area of upstander action. So it amazes me that we have already spent 30 minutes, 27 minutes on this topic because, um, you know, I personally just feel so passionate about it. And I know, Virginia, you do as well. Um, and, you know, I just want to say that having worked alongside Virginia for years, uh, the brewing industry is so fortunate to have you um, and to have had your leadership um, to have these conversations over the years. Thank you so much. Um, and as you were you know, speaking, actually, it uh, reminded me of something that I'm also super passionate about, which is practicing, mm -hmm. right? Like you get better with these conversations when you practice. And I like to start, and I did in fact start my courageous conversation training in safe environments with people that I knew and trusted and had even told them, like, I'm looking to work on getting more comfortable with courageous conversations. Would you be willing to help? And my husband, who's our brewmaster and my business partner was my first partner, if you will, in, you know, just having an opportunity, we even role played sometimes, but the ability to, you know, say to him, you know, that hurt my feelings. If you want to get someone's attention, you say, ooh, that hurt my feelings. Like, what? What? What, did, what did I do? What did I say? And so just being able to start with him in a safe place with knowing that I was trying to work on these skills, if you will, um, made it so much more comfortable to have those conversations with people I didn't know that well in work situations, in you know, conference situations. So I would also maybe um, encourage our audience to think about that as a tactic. Absolutely. I love that. And, and good for you and your husband for being willing to, to do that. Um, so, you know, I just want to leave you with this. Um, if this has really sparked curiosity in your own mind about opportunities to learn more, um, we exist, the National Conflict Resolution Center exists to provide you these resources, to be able to provide these workshops and trainings for your team, for you. And so we have so many, we probably have 20 different workshops, um, but the Bystander Challenge is really uh, one of our most popular, uh, along with other topics like the art of inclusive communication. We have a workshop on how to give and receive constructive feedback, which certainly taps into this a little bit. Um, and we even have an entire four-week certificate program for workplace leaders 
called the Culture Communication and Conflict Certificate um, that takes you through four of our most um, our most popular workshops. The Bystander Challenge is included in that, Art of Inclusive Communication, um, the Exchange, Artful Conversation. They're all part of this workshop, and it's really designed for workplace leaders to help you navigate today's workplace. So if you want to do a deep dive, that's a great one to look into as well. Um, all of this information can be found on our website, which is ncrconline.com. And I also put my email up here because you're welcome to reach out to me at any point if you have any questions. Um, we also provide, as Virginia knows, we provide a ton of free resources on our social media channels. So every single week we provide free videos and tips of tackling kind of something in the workplace. And so I encourage you, if you're not already following us on social, just have access to those free resources at a minimum. Um, but, but do reach out. We would love to work with you. We'd love to support your journey in having a team of upstanders. And um, of course, you know, once you finish training and go home for the day, uh, you should you should definitely also have a beer and celebrate your wonderful uh, upstander work at Second Chance Beer Company. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. We would love to welcome all of you to our tasting rooms. And I just want to finish by saying, you know, I have worked with a lot of different organizations in this space for many years, dating back to my employment law career. And the National Conflict Resolution Center is absolutely by far the best, most thoughtful, most structured, most um, kind of complete uh, solution that I found. And so I really would encourage you if you have the resources or, you know, basically set aside the resources to do more training with them or just follow their content. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Virginia. Thank you all for being with us today. We value you and we are here for you as a resource. So don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks and take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.